Darius Leonard is ranked as the best linebacker in the NFL. Is being a finalist still enough for HBCUs when it comes to recruiting? And Chelsea Lucas bears all and tells her side of the story. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. <laughs> Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU podcast, your number one. Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU Athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. Follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives, and let's talk about what happened on the show, what's happening in the HBCU landscape. I'm here for all of that. But one thing I'm especially here for is the praise of Darius Leonard. I've sang his praises on this show before, and now he's received a big-time honor. It's really been a great weekend for Darius Leonard because he was recognized as the best HBCU player in the NFL over the last 10 years, and then he's also been recognized as the best linebacker in the NFL right now. Currently, as is going on, not a totality of his of his resume. This is simply just another thing to add to the resume going into the 2022 season or following the 2021 season, depending on how you want to put it, of course. Darius Leonard was the best linebacker in the NFL. Now, when he was graded the best NFL player from an HBCU over the last decade, that was me. That was a mouth of the South thing, right? I came on locked on HBCU and I did that. But when you look at the best linebacker in the NFL, that comes from his peers. That comes from players he played against, players he plays with, players or coaches he went against, coaches who coach him, executives. It goes from people who should have a more intimate knowledge of Darius Leonard and how he affects planning more than even I could. Right. Because I can sit there and I can watch the game. You can sit there and you can watch the game. However, how Darius Leonard affects what the opponent thinks is something that we cannot really understand. There's 31 teams in the NFL. I don't know if he's faced them all, but there's 31 teams in the NFL who can understand that, who do understand what game planning and sitting down and saying, OK, this guy right here, this linebacker Leonard, that's somebody that we have to look out for. There's a different type of intimacy when knowing someone's game on that level that we just don't have to have, right? But I love it because this list, this top 10 positional list by ESPN, right? They never seem as shaky, as unbelievable as that top 100 list by NFL Network. A lot of times that feels like playing favorites. And you look at it and you say, hmm, eh, I don't... That guy, it's a lot of questioning when it comes to that top 100. This top 10 list is pretty valid. Um, I don't suggest you use it as gospel because it's still 50 execs, 50. It's a whole lot of people joining in and giving their opinion where not everybody said Darius Leonard was the top ranked uh, linebacker in the NFL. Some had him as low as six, right? But still, that's a great number. I, I use it as a way to guide me. When I'm watching... After reading this, what do I need to look out for? What players do I need to look out for? Those, That's what I use this list for. And it's pretty solid. So you should really put some stock into this. I think it's pretty believable. And at least in my estimation, most of these lists have been pretty okay, right? Um, but let's get into it. Let's read exactly what was said about Darius Leonard because I want to just talk about him and not just talk about why the list is good. So Leonard remains, like I said, he was a... High of one, the low of six. Last year, he was four. So he's still, mind you, he's still in this mix as far as a top five linebacker. But um, last year, he was four. This year, he's one. Leonard remains a, sp a splash play generator. His combination of eight forced fumbles and four interceptions in 2021 led this group by a wide margin. The Colts gave Leonard a $99.2 million extension before last season because of his ability to get the ball back to his offense with link length and explosion. This is a quote from a high-ranking AFC executive saying he can flip the game at any moment. 
that worries you more as an opponent than a traditional linebacker because he gets his hands on the ball all of the time. Let's get into the ranking real quick. You go from one to six. That's, that's as low as he was at six, as high as he was at one, clearly because he was ranked number one. So it's not a consensus, but when you look at it, you can tell that he's consistently one of the top caliber linebackers. You're looking at a top five player for sure. I don't use these things to tell me, oh, he's the best. I'm going to have my own opinion, right? You know, like, for example, number two is Michael Parsons. I don't agree with that. I don't I don't think that Michael Parsons is the number two off-ball linebacker. Personally, I think that he probably should have been in the, uh, in the edge category. That's me personally. I feel like that was his damage. I don't know. That's my... Not my not my lane to discuss. Go check out Locked On Cowboys for that. But that's personally what I think, right? I don't think he's an off ball linebacker. Um, so I was kind of surprised to see him there at number two. But whatever. I don't have to agree with the list. But this should give you an idea that, hey, if you're number one or number six or anywhere in between, you are elite at your job. That's what this is. And I want to read something that I feel like was the most impactful sentence in there. And that was a, a he can flip the game. Right. That's already worrisome, but it's how he flips the game. And it's what they were talking about. It said that worries you more than an <clears throat> excuse me. That worries you more as an opponent than the traditional linebacker because he can get his hands on the ball all the time. So, number one, getting your hands on the ball is something that concerns you as an opponent. That's number one. More than any other linebacker who's just going to make your tackles and racking up. It's not a splash play. When you're looking at a linebacker who can get turnovers, that's what you start to worry about. And then he does this all the time. So that's just a bonus stacked on top of a bonus. And I think it really speaks and it, it really shows off what we were talking about not that long ago when talking about how his turnovers are really what sets him apart. I love it when you read this, when you read people who are supposed to be in the know and they agree with you, don't it just feel good? Doesn't it just feel good when when you sit in there, you say, man, I see X, Y and Z. And then somebody who's supposed to be a high ranking scout or somebody who's supposed to really be in a no says we see X, Y and Z and y'all completely line up. It's a beautiful feeling. It feels justified. It feels like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. And that's the kind of the feeling that I get here when I look at them talk about the splash play generation that really sets him apart from everybody else. And that's something that I think as well, I think. Whether you want to talk about he's number one or not, the ability to create splash plays is always going to be valuable. And to say he can flip the game as a linebacker, not as a, a, a person who is going to be covering your top wide receiver, not as somebody who's going to be pressuring your quarterback, as an off-ball linebacker to say that he can flip the game, I think is as big of a, a praise as you can hand out to a linebacker. That speaks volumes to just how impactful that he is. So Darius Leonard, we recognize him, South Carolina State legend, great, right? Former MEAC player of the year, defensive player of the year. But now he's went to the league. He's had a successful career. We can add one more thing to that resume, and that's the 2021, I'll say, best linebacker in the NFL. That's exactly what we can say about Darius Leonard. But I have something else I got to say, more so of a question. If you would allow me, I would like to sit down and brainstorm with you and really think about how we should feel about HBCUs being a part of a recruit's finalist list, but not actually making his cut. I want to know how y'all feel about that. I'll tell you about me. But first, I want to tell you about LinkedIn Jobs, because as the sun comes out and small businesses are back in business, LinkedIn Jobs make it easy to grow your team because, listen, LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the people that you want to interview faster. I know people who have reached out and said, I want this job. I'm qualified and they actually got the job it's that direct connection between employer and hopeful employee that makes linkedin jobs stand out from everybody else you can create a free job post in minutes on linkedin jobs and make sure that you're using the hashtag hiring frame it should be purple so it should really stand out to you but listen simple tools like screening questions make it easy for the candidates with just the right skills and experience for you to find so you can prioritize them over some that maybe not fit your requirements, let's say, right? So LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. And did you know that nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is LinkedIn jobs slash locked on or LinkedIn jobs.com slash locked on college. And remember that terms and conditions do apply. 
All right, so keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day I do appreciate it. And today's word of the day is carp. It means to complain in an annoying way. So I want to continue going forward, and I have a question. Jackson State just made the finalist for another big-time recruit. But is that still enough? Is it still enough to just be the finalist for a recruit? I say yes right now. But for how long? I think both are important questions when discussing HBCUs. Is it okay to just be a finalist and not get that player? And then also, if that's okay with you, if you're currently all right with that, how long are you going to be okay with that? And recruiting is a is a crapshoot. You never know what's going to happen. When Travis Hunter signed to Jackson State, I don't think many people outside of maybe the closest people to Deion Sanders thought that he was going to sign with Jackson State. It, it just was not a move that many anticipated. And when I say it's a crapshoot, I mean, you have players who commit, decommit. You're dealing with teenagers, so easily change their mind, right? And you, you have... A lot of times you have four hats on the table. Players will pull out a fifth hat. Like, where did this team come from? Where, 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 did, where did that team come from? We didn't think that was going to happen. Now, sometimes you have family ties that make you feel like, oh, that player is going to go to whatever school. But for the most part, it's a crapshoot. We don't really know what's happening until the end of the, in, uh, end of the signing period. So that's kind of it's, – it's okay. Like, it's not a big deal. But – when I asked this question, it comes from the fact that Peter Woods, a defensive lineman who actually just committed to Clemson, had Jackson State in his, in his um, finalist. And I wanted to talk, come on here and talk about Peter Woods. I said that at the end of yesterday's episode, or Friday's episode, excuse me. That's not the case. Not in the way that I want it. It's not talking about Peter Woods coming to Jackson State. It's talking about is just being a finalist enough. Because now Desmond Ricks, a cornerback, defensive back out of, um, I believe he's out of Florida. IMG has so many people, so you don't really know who's out of where, but whatever. IMG's in Florida. So um, a cornerback out of IMG has Jackson State in his finalist list. Now, I can only imagine an offense or a defensive backfield with Travis Hunter and Desmond Ricks, two of the top ranked commits in their class. I believe that Ricks is uh, number two. If he's not the number two player, he's the number two cornerback. Uh, off the top of my head so he's really decorated this is good right this is good you should want this to be the case so why am I even questioning it I had to ask myself did Travis Hunter signing to Jackson State make me feel entitled what kind of impact did that signing have on how I how I look at HBCU recruiting and I can't, I thought about it and I came to the conclusion that it doesn't have me feeling entitled. It just makes me feel like it's possible. But also recruiting is about hunger. You're supposed to be hungry. Let, I'm, I'm going to pick a middle of the pack SEC team. I'm sorry. But University of Tennessee, if University of Tennessee is a finalist for five big time recruits over the next two years and they don't get any of them, Rocky Top ain't going to be rocking the same. It's not. It's because you're hungry. It's, you're supposed to be. I think that the idea of satisfaction in sports is one where, yeah, you can be happy with what you got. So I guess you are kind of satisfied, but you always kind of looking for that next. If, if you didn't accomplish the goal, it's not good enough. And that goes for a lot in like real life as well. But recruiting, it's like being close ain't good. Ain't, it ain't good enough. It just is not good enough, and that's the idea. That's the competition. It's the competitiveness that you should ap approach it with. It's not entitlement. It's not saying that all big-time recruits are going to come to HBCUs. I'm not ignorant. I'm not. It's still a shock that Travis Hunter did it. It's still a shock that Kevin Coleman did it. So I'm not ignorant of the fact that they don't have the same allure as some of these Power 5 schools. I'm not ignorant of the fact of that. So it's, it's not an entitlement factor. It's not like I believe that it should happen. I want it to happen, and I'm hungry for it to happen. So that's what it is. I'm not entitled. I'm hungry. So that was an instinct, a distinction that I had to make within. But now that we make that distinction, when I say for how long, I'm fearful that this is trendy. I look at the climate that we're in. I look at the climate that we're in, and it's cool to show love to HBCUs. It's cool to love HBCUs right now. Keyword on right now. So three years down the line, will that still be cool? Will that still be the hip thing to do? See, I'm fearful with it being trendy that the trend will burn out. I'm fearful that with it being trendy in a couple of years, you won't see it. But it's not about seeing it. 
It's about the fact that I feel like they're using it. Some, some. Because the thing with trends is everybody is not going to be fully invested. Some people are just hopping on the trend to be cool. Mikey Williams, I think he for real. If he doesn't pick an HBCU, okay. That is what it is. But if he does pick an HBCU, it's not going to be surprising. And also, he's shown love for a decent amount of time where it wasn't cool to put HBCUs in your final finalist list as a high-profile recruit when he did it as a freshman. It just was not cool to do. So whether HBCUs are in his finalist list now or not, I'm still showing love because I know that came from the heart. I know it was genuine. I know that some people hop on waves, hop on trends just because it's the cool thing to do. It's cool. It takes nothing to put an HBCU in your finalist list if you're not going to pick them, especially when you already know who you're going to pick. It's not like I presented you and said, hey, you have these four schools, pick somebody. No, I had probably 10 in my head. I dwindled it down to four. I probably already know what my one or two is going to be. So if I knew I was picking between Clemson and Alabama, just using, for example, when it comes to Woods, if I knew I was picking between Clemson and Alabama, those last two schools, they don't mean nothing. They're just window dressing. It looked good. I just don't want that to be HBCUs. Now, the impact of a high-profile recruit naming your HBCU, I does think I do think impacts most HBCUs. Um, if you South Carolina State, who is a great team, who has been highly successful, and they put a high-profile recruit says we're we're interested in South Carolina State, that'll elevate your profile, right? So it's not about talent level, you know. Really, all the schools in the MEAC, I don't think, get the visibility of SWAC schools. South Carolina State is your Celebration Bowl champions. They are your Black national champions. And I think they will get a big boost as far as eyes go. I'm only talking about eyes and visibility. If a high-profile recruit like a Desmond Ricks, like a um, Peter Woods, were to come in and say, oh, yeah, that's one of my top teams. Oh, South Carolina State, let me look at that. I feel like the profile of HBCU football has been lifted. But by a few, I don't think it's everybody. And this, once again, is not about talent. It's about the person who does not pay attention. The person who completely does not pay attention to HBCU football, what schools are they hearing about? I think it's Jackson State. I think it's Grambling. I think it's FAMU. That's me personally, right? Um, I thought about adding Southern on the list, but I, I just ended up, it didn't make the cut fully for me. It was a feel thing, not a, a talent thing. It was a feel thing. But Jackson State, oh, that's Dion School. Uh, Grambling, oh, ain't, ain't Hugh Jackson coaching there? And I don't know. Maybe I got a lot of FAMU people in my ear, right? And that's maybe I see a lot of FAMU on Twitter, but they just feel like that. I mean, Willie Simmons isn't isn't Hugh Jackson or Deion Sanders as, as far as notoriety to people who don't pay attention to HBCUs. But maybe I just got a lot of FAM chatter, but they feel like one of those schools that people are like, oh, yeah, FAM, that feels like a trendy school. Kayvon Thibodeau, he visited FAMU, right? So I just fear that it's trendy. If you're one of those schools that's not one of the three I named, this is going to be big for a long time coming because you're always going to get eyes. It's always going to be a trickle-down effect of this high-profile recruit shouted you out. Maybe some of the people under him will then gravitate towards as well as far as the way that HBCU football is trending. But if you're one of those three, two, three years from now, if it's still trendy to show love and they're still doing it, I'm going to feel like y'all riding waves and not really committed or not really thinking about it, but using it as a way to say, oh, yeah, I think about HBCUs. Should I still thank you for that three years down the line? I'm not quite sure. I'll allow you to tell me. Hopefully, I don't sound entitled. I'm just hungry for more talent to come to HBCUs. But y'all let me know in the comments below or on Twitter what you think about that. Going forward, we're going to be talking about Chelsea Lucas, who has finally gave, given her side of the story, and she bears all. And she has a really big twist on how this whole situation actually went down from her point of view. But before we get into that, let me tell you about Bet Online because Bet Online is the best place for all of your wagering needs, no matter what the sport is. If we're talking about futures in the NBA and the NFL, Bet Online has you covered. If we're talking about where people are going to land, Bet Online has you covered. If we're talking about NASCAR, we're talking about um, MLB, Bet Online truly does have you covered, and it's not just sports, right? You're also going to have your favorite Vegas casino games, you're going to have esports. You're also going to have some podcasts to give you some insight. There's so much on Bet Online that they're so versatile, you can't help but to love them. The minute that you open up your, your desktop or your phone browser, it does not matter. You go there to betonline.net and you will realize why we call them the fastest and easiest place to wager on all of your wager needs. Bet Online, where the game starts. 
All right, it's wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU. I'm done. I'm done carping if that's what it sounded like about recruitment. And I'm going to get to somebody who I actually expected to carp, but I absolutely did not. There was no complaining, for real. She did shed some tears, but for the most part, there was no complaining, and it definitely was not annoying. It just felt like somebody giving their side of the story, and that's Chelsea Lucas. She gave us exactly what we needed on Friday. Actually, I think it dropped probably a little bit after the episode where I said we need her side of the story. We need it. Well, we got it. And it's just that simple. She went on an interview with 24-7 Sports and just talked about how the whole grambling situation went down. And before we get into some of the quotes, she said two things that were very impactful. She said, one, I did not cut everybody. That did not happen. And then number two, the AD told me to. Forget all the quotes. These are narrative shifting things. Now, did I expect her to say she cut everybody? No. I didn't expect her to throw her hands up and say, I did it. You caught me red-handed. No, I didn't expect that. Um, after the conversation on the spaces, I expected her to come in and say that she didn't cut everybody. Um, I thought that maybe there would be a justification for it. But when you say you didn't do it, there, there's no justification needed. But the second thing that was said was the more impactful and one of the things that make you just sit back and say, what? Because that was the fact that she says the AD told her to do it. It wasn't a, an insinuating or insinuation of what was said, no. She said she was literally ordered, this was her words, or literally directed to cut them all. I am, l- listen, if you're on the audio, you can't see my facial expression, but even expressing this, because I read it, I listened to her say it, and I, this is the first time I said it out loud. This has me speechless because this is completely narrative shifting. This flips everything on top of their head. Because not only is she saying, I didn't do what you accused me of, but if I did do it, if I did cut everybody on that volleyball team, I was directed to do it by my higher ups, by the athletic director. Don't look at me like I'm the evil one. If I did it, I didn't do it. But if I did do it, don't look at me like I was evil. I was just following the order. Matter of fact, I told them no. Instead of looking looking evil or looking bad, which is how I think she's been depicted through this whole thing, she's been depicted as how could you possibly cut everybody? What a terrible woman. That's how she's been depicted. No. Not only was I directed to do that thing that you think is so terrible, I said no. Oh, how the plot thickens. <laughs> how the plot thickens. It's one thing. Say I didn't do it, but to involve the athletic director, this isn't good for Grambling. This got a lot messier for Grambling. Um, like I said, I'm not shocked that she didn't that she said she didn't do it, but to say that the AD ordered it, that was something that I was, I was like, wow. Um, when you look at it, if she would have cut the whole volleyball team, everybody was gonna look at her as if. What was wrong with that team to where you couldn't do it, right? That would be a question. What was wrong with that team where you couldn't do it with any of those players? Now, I got something for you. She didn't say this was the reason. This was just another comment that she made within the interview. And that was that this was a bad character team from the higher ups is what she got this from. She didn't say it was a bad character team from her point of view, but that's how she was brought in. Like, this is a bad character team. That would be a reason that you want to cut everybody. And not cutting every, or the AD saying to cut everybody is a reason that you could have seen, seen the AD come out and say, we completely support Miss Lucas at the beginning. But now you have that narrative shifting thing. What was the reason? Why did this narrative that she cut everybody even come about? And if you ask her, she'll say it's because a former player from another school infiltrated the grambling ranks and came up with this plan for them to get her fired. And it it reminds me, it makes me think of a quote from the boondocks that I'll edit for language wise on the podcast, but it had me think to myself, dang, what does she do to make this person that mad? You know how vindictive and how upset you have to be with somebody to follow them to their new job, talk to their new players and say, you have to get this player fired or get this coach fired. What did she do? (laughs) Right. So 
According to her, before she even got hired, there was a plan to get her fired. It was a collected or calculated plan, as she said. So this wasn't some on a whim. And she got this information from a from a former player who or a player who stuck around on the team, because first off, she didn't have 19. She says she only started with 14. She didn't cut everybody and she gave some a chance to come on. She told those who were cut why they were cut, which she said she didn't get from Grambling as far as why she was fired. But that's a whole different story. But I'm just presenting facts, facts here. All right. Um, but those who didn't leave, one came and said, hey, they planned on getting you fired. And within this story that she gave on this 20 minute uh, interview, she involved a lot of people. I don't think that this is over. It could go by the wayside because it's volleyball. That's possible. But this situation is going to get a whole lot messy. And she's involved enough people to where somebody should be able to corroborate her story if she's telling the truth. It should. It she should. That's just what should happen. She said a former player said it. That player should be able to come out and speak. Um, she had the AD and I think some higher ups that were around. Now, they might take each other's side, but they should be able to come out and corroborate her story in a perfect, you know, ideal world. This is a big time. This is a big time story, and I'm not quite sure where to go with it. I'll tell you that the side of the girls is that she unjustly cut us all with no opportunity to actually win a spot on the roster. And according to Chelsea Lucas, I didn't cut everybody. Some just left, and I was ordered by the AD to do these things. And I still have yet to hear why I actually was fired or what you found in your investigation. Oh, this is so messy. I don't know. I don't think this is done. I, gen I genuinely believe that we will be talking about this soon coming up. And best believe we're going to cover it right here on Locked on HBCU. So continue making us your first listen of the day. I, I might try to find somebody close to Grambling to see how they believe this impacts the, the brand of Grambling right now. And that might be something I try to get done on the next episode. If not, then hopefully Friday, because I really want to hear from, from a Gram fam, right? A Grambling alum on what their opinion is of this. So just be on the lookout for that. That might be what we do on Wednesday's episode. But for your second listen of the day, make sure that you're checking out our conference shows, Locked on ACC with Candace Cooper, friend of the show. I'm always going to shout her out, Locked on SEC with Chris Gordy. Those are just two of the many that we have here on Locked on Network. Now, y'all know me. Y'all know where to find me. But in the meantime, in between time, if you don't, you can catch me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care. Stay blessed. Peace.